Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Dr. Paul Myers and I'm the Director of Research and Development at the Readiness and Emergency Management for Schools Technical Assistance Center, also known as the Readiness TA Center, which is administered by the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Safe and Healthy Students, or OSHS. I'd like to welcome you to the webinar conducting a secure, safe and successful K-12 family reunification process. During today's event, presenters from the Arizona Department of Education, Hamden Wilbraham Regional School District, Chandler Police Department, OSHS, and the REMS TA Center will discuss how schools and school districts can better prepare for family reunification after an emergency. We previously hosted two other webinars on related topics in emergency evacuations, planning for the whole school community. We discussed how the K-12 community can pre prepare for evacuations, and in reunification after a community-wide disaster, planning tools for schools, we discussed reunification after a disaster that affects not only the school, but the whole locality. We also shared useful tools, such as the Federal Emergency Management Agencies or FEMA's National Emergency Family Registry Locator System. Both archived events are available on the REMS CA Center's website on our webinars page. And you can find a link to both events in the web links box on your screen. Here you can view the webinars and download accompanying materials such as the slides and resource guides. The topic of today's event is different from that of prior webinars and we will discuss planning considerations for reunification after an emergency that affects just the school and not the whole community. And also steps that can be taken after an evacuation. Today's webinar is also being recorded and will be made available on the TA Center's website via our webinars page, along with an accompanying resource guide within 10 business days. Links to the webinars page is available in the web links box on your screen. Before we start, we have a few brief housekeeping items to discuss. We'll reference several resources throughout the webinar. These items, as well as descriptions of them and their URLs, are provided in the resource guide in the handout box on your screen. As a reminder, there is no dial-in for this webinar. Audio is available via the, web, via the link provided. If you're experiencing difficulty hearing the audio stream, please turn up your computer speaker volume at this time. If you experienced any technical difficulties during the webinar, contact the TA Center at info at remstacenter.org. You may also request technical assistance using the Q&A box on your screen. Questions are viewable to the webinar moderator only. To pose a question to the presenters during the webinar, use the Q&A tool on your screen to send a message to the moderator. You may ask questions at any time during the webinar, although they'll be answered as time permits following the presentation. After today's event, you can post questions in our community of practice, or you can email them again to info at remstacenter.org. I'd like to briefly introduce the presenters for today's webinar, and their full bios are available in the handouts box on your screen. Jim Lee retired from the Paradise Valley Unified School District after 36 years of service, where he served as a classroom teacher, principal, and district director of student services. He currently serves as an emergency response advisor for the Arizona, Arizona Department of Education and is a trainer for FEMA's Emergency Management Institute, the Arizona Department of Emergency and Military Affairs, and the REMS TA Center. Dr. Gina Khan is a school psychologist and prevention specialist who has worked in the Hamden Wilbraham Regional School District in Western Massachusetts for over 25 years. As the Safe and Healthy Students Programs Director, she has coordinated several of the district's school safety, climate, and behavioral health integration initiatives. Officer Stephen Jew has been with the Chandler Police Department for 14 years and has served as a school resource officer for 10. For the last eight years, Officer Jew has been the school resource officer trainer for the Arizona Department of Education in the implementation of the Arizona School Safety Program. He's currently assigned to the Mesa Public School District. We'll now take a moment to review the agenda. Madeline Sullivan from EDS OSHS will first provide a brief overview of planning for family reunification at schools and school districts. 
We'll then host and moderate a discussion where you'll hear key considerations on family reunification from a few different perspectives. Jim will provide a broader perspective of planning for family reunification. Gina will discuss support for students and families. And Stephen will share security considerations. We'll close the webinar with a Q&A session. After the webinar, please join us on the Community of Practice to ask additional questions about this topic and to further engage in the conversation. I'm now going to hand things over to Madeline, who is a Management and Program Analyst in EDS OSHS. She administers the REMS CA Center with Bronwyn Roberts, our Director. Madeline represents the Agency on Federal Working Groups and Initiatives, such as the National Disaster Recovery Framework and Preparathon, alongside working with state and local practitioners. Prior to joining the federal government, she provided technical assistance on pro-social skill development, violence prevention, and school emergency management after having served as a special educator. So Madeline, over to you. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, everyone. Um, we really appreciate you being here. And we encourage you to stay in touch um, following the webinar and participating in our communities of practice, which if you're watching this webinar archived, will still be there. And so um, discuss away. <laughs> so first, I just wanted to give a broad overview of the topic. So as we mentioned earlier, this webinar is going to focus on, um, on school reunification, family reunification after an emergency that affects an individual school as opposed to the whole school community. So it's not uncommon that schools need to um, activate their reunification process due to um, an emergency, such as a building fire or a power outage or other small emergencies, such as um, gas leaks and things like that. So in these instances, a typical school dismissal may not be possible. So instead, um, schools still need to reunite the students with their families and guardians, and um, it's going to be at the school or, if needed, at an off-site family reunification area. One thing I want you to remember as we discuss this topic, um, you want to be thinking about it in relationship to the reunification you do every day. Schools have a tremendous amount of expertise on this topic, and it's a matter of modifying your existing daily, existing daily plans um, so as to meet the needs of the whole school community during an emergency or during an atypical uh, school day. So family reunification is typically used after an emergency incident. And um, as you can imagine, uh, parents and guardians may be understandably anxious and concerned about their children. And you're going to hear later in the webinar that there are some meaningful actions that schools and school districts can take in advance and during to not only ensure that the process is safe and secure, but also to help people understand their roles and responsibilities um, that is going to promote that smooth and effective reunification. But also they're going to learn about what the schools are doing to keep their children safe. And that will help lessen their anxiety until they get to um, be with their, with their child. So um, then um, we also want to keep in mind that um, that uh, throughout this process of a reunification, there are going to be steps that you will be taking to ensure that the students and staff are safe and that the students are engaged in meaningful activities and that the guardians um, know where to go and what they need to do to be prepared for the reunification and um, such as one that is often a challenge if it's a surprise, and that is the fact that um, the students can only be released to that authorized caregiver. One resource that can be especially re useful as you create um, your protocols or your annex for family reunification at school is those principles and planning concepts that are put forth in the guide for developing high-quality school emergency operations plans. We call it the school guide for short, and I think that many of you are familiar with, with both titles. So we have a link um, to this in your web box on your screen, but also please remember that the, we present this information in numerous formats and in numerous lengths on the REMS TA Center website. That way we're better able to meet 
the needs and um, learning preferences of everyone where you are working to support. So this school guide um, provides several planning principles and they are the foundation for um, school safety, security, and emergency management as it relates to preparedness. And when we say preparedness, we're talking about prevention, mitigation, protection, response, and recovery. So one of these planning principles that is especially pertinent um, to planning for school reunification is that creating and um, that when you're creating this plan or revising it after real world incidents or trainings, you want to do it in a collaborative manner. So in this webinar today, we are demonstrating that. You're going to hear from three um, professionals that all have a different set of experiences based on their different roles as part of that planning team. So uh, um, this is just another example of something that can't be done in isolation. And it's going to rely on the help from all these different um, practitioners, that multidisciplinary team both of those from within the school system and those from the community, such as your school resource officer or your law enforcement officer. And then also um, keep in mind the additional community partners um, that offer a wealth of resources, in particular that behavioral health practitioner that is with the local um, social services agency. These folks are especially important for some of the more uh, traumatic events, and they're going to help with providing um, psychological first aid and different activities like that. But in addition to collaboration, we encourage you to think about the planning principles that um, it's going to be done in collaboration. You want to provide for the whole school community, especially when regards to this critical function. You want to think about all settings and all times and things like that. Okay, so um, as many of you know, the school guide puts forth the six-step planning process, and uh, um, these can be done in sequence, or you can go back and forth as needed. So this is what we use to, um, to guide the planning team in having those meaningful discussions and um, posing those questions for consideration to help craft those goals and objectives and protocols or courses of action to help protect the whole school community before, during, and after. And it's through these discussions that we're able to identify those common functions. And one of them is reunification. Um, there's a number of different circumstances in which a school might need to activate its reunification annex. So uh, um, if you'd like more information on the six-step planning process, as I was saying earlier, we have um, multiple resources that will help you with it, from a nice um, REMS Express publication to a webinar and even an online course. Okay, so as the planning team progresses through the six step planning process, they'll be able to identify those actions that the school or school district is going to take in order to reunite the students with their families and their guardians. So this is included in the family school reunification annex of the EOP. And then um, one thing that's very important, uh, going back to our conversation about collaboration, when the school does its reunification annex, it's very important that you have at the table members from um, your local municipality, whether that's a city or a county. And you need to ensure that those two plans are integrated. So just like NIMS, we talk about it being scalable and you would activate different operations based on the event. Same thing with this reunification annex. So as the community is going to be contributing to that school family reunification, you also need to be ready to um, work together in the event that there's an, um, a reunification that involves the whole community. OK, now also please keep in mind um, as we go through and are developing annexes based on their common functions that there's going to be related functions to your reunification. So for example, your communication um, annex is going to be activated at the same time. OK, so today we're just doing a brief um, overview of the essentials of 
of uh, planning for family reunification at school. Um, but more, you're going to hear about some, some strategies um, from our colleagues who are on the phone with us today. So if you want to learn more about the details and those key considerations that are going to guide those conversations with your partners, we encourage you to go check out some of the other um, great resources that we've worked on and developed together. And uh, um, so Paul has kindly put in the web links um, pod for you some of our resources that are dedicated specifically to this topic. So one of them is a downloadable training package. And um, one of the modules in here is, is the School Reunification um, Annex. So um, our entire training package for each module includes a PowerPoint, a tabletop, and other resources that you can use to brush up on your own knowledge or if you're knowledgeable or if you are a trainer or a leader at your school or school district or state, um, whether it's a state emergency management agency or a local um, local one or the state education agency, we encourage you to take this training package and turn around and use it to train your colleagues. Another one is we have a sample family reunification annex. So we created this based on um, those meaningful discussions and input from different practitioners in, in K-12 school um, emergency management. So we included sample goals and objectives and courses of action or those um, individual protocols for a specific building that you might identify as you are going through that six-step process and having those conversations. And then at the end, um, we have reached out to different districts and we've included some sample forms that are commonly used. So, and then in that note, we do have a toolbox. If you haven't seen the toolbox, I highly encourage you to do so. Here, we um, store a variety of materials or tools and forms and policies and protocols and such that have been created by practitioners just like you. So uh, um, there, they have offered these for your, um, for your looking, for your perusal, and so that you can see how others have done it, and it might help influence your work. And then we have our newest part of the website, and that is our topic-specific web page. So you can go there, and it provides links to more resources on school family reunification. OK. So um, just wanted to give you a couple pieces of information in case you're not very familiar with the topic, so you can better follow the conversation and the um, insight that Gina Jim and Steven are going to be sharing with you. So one, um, if you look at this, this is just like one possible way to design a reunification center or location um, area. Obviously, it's going to be very based on your school building and campus, and also the resources and needs of you and your community partners. But here, we just wanted to point out a couple of, of um, components that are powerful. So one is to point out the family check-in gate. So this is where the, the parents and the guardians are going to check in. When they first arrive, they're going to complete those student release forms and provide you with that identification so that you're able to verify that they have the authority to, um, to that you have the authority to release the student to them. So one thing, one strategy is often relayed is that you want them to be able to see their children but not communicate with them. So it's important that they have that sense that their child's okay, but at the same time, you want to avoid them being able to bypass any of the procedures and just leave with their child. Which brings us to the other component, which is that student assembly area. So this is where they're going to be waiting until their families are there and you're able to release them to their families and guardians. Again, this needs to be separate. Um, but also another consideration is you want to make sure it's a con uh, it's the area in a way can contain them and the adults there can manage the, the students because you wouldn't, if you think about some of those older students who might drive to school or feel that they can walk off campus, you don't want it to be possible for that um, as you're maintaining your accounting um, for all the well-being of all your students. 
And then we have another component for consideration, and that is the family waiting area. So after they've been cleared for reunification, there's going to be the process of getting the student and bringing them to them. And then we have the command center, and that's where um, the different community um, partners and school officials are working together and working on communication and, and all sorts of different um, tactical aspects of that incident command and the media area. <laughs> now this is another one that you really need to have some, some lengthy conversations with your partners and really think it through. So you need to provide them with a place that, um, and keep in mind how much room they're going to take up, not just them um, you know, congregating, but their vehicles and sometimes those um, vans with the cellular or mobile options and such. And we also need to make sure that we are, we are providing for that privacy factor for the students and their families. So there's a, again, there's a lot to be um, considered. And uh, yeah, and then another, some people say that they should be able to have some sort of view, but nothing too close, because they need to have, they need to have their media as well. But again, we have to really focus on that privacy, and then also maintaining that calm. OK. So well, there's a few more additional um, planning considerations. I'm just going to go over them very briefly, just so you can keep it in mind as you're listening to Jim and Gina and, um, and Stephen. So as you're working with your partners, think about how are you going to inform your families about the process in advance, and also ways that you can teach them or impart to them in advance their roles and responsibilities. So many folks do it through the media, through um, uh, you know announcements, and letters home, back to school night. Um, we always recommend folks that you do it via social media. Um, the more you get them accustomed to going to a social media profile in advance, the more likely they're going to go there during an emergency. Ultimately, we want to make sure that we can um, inhibit them from taking an action that's going to put them at risk or their child at risk or um, interfere with this process. So as you know, we do a lockdown when it's safer inside the school than it is outside the school. We wouldn't want a family member rushing to the front door if there was um, a, a, an ongoing threat right, out, you know, right outside that school building. OK, so um, you definitely need to have um, an agreement and documented and informed procedure um, describing when it is determined that an adult is authorized or you're you are authorized to release a student to an adult. And then um, how are you going to facilitate communication between the reunification site, the checking gate, and all those things? How are you going to protect the privacy of the students? And we just went over a few examples of that. So um, and then we're just going to go a few more. OK, so again, this can, because it's stressful, um, or it could be stressful, there's likely to be confusion. So the more you teach folks in advance, you're going to alleviate a lot of that stress and confusion. And so um, one thing is we've all been asked to wait. And this is one of the hardest times as a parent or a guardian to wait. So think about those frequent updates. One thing we hear time and time again is that, especially during emergencies, those families, they want updates, even if it is to say that nothing has changed. So they need to know that you are actively caring for their child, and you are actively trying to reunite them. And then, as we mentioned earlier, you need to take steps so as to prevent students from leaving on their own. And then, most importantly, or not most importantly, but it is so important, you really need to think about the needs of that whole school community. So. Um, Think about it in terms of language and communications. Think about it in terms of having nonverbal communications. Think about when you're, when you're setting up that, um, that whole reunification site, is it accessible by wheelchair, and so on. So you, you, you need to think that through, because that can cause more challenges. And you really want this to be smooth. And again, like I said earlier, you have what it takes to do it, because you do it every day. And on that note, thank you for everything you do every day to protect students and staff around the nation. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Paul. Great. Thanks, Madeline. 
We're now going to move into the moderated discussion where you'll hear the different perspectives on planning for family reunification. We'll begin by discussing how to choose a site and create reunification areas. So I'll start with, uh, with Jim. So Jim, regarding planning for family reunification, how do your schools locate reunification sites and uh, what are the different considerations for on versus off-site locations? Thank you, Paul. Well, the nature of the event will determine on-site versus off-site reunification. Many school districts plan for off-site reunification only, and that certainly can be a mistake. But for both uh, on and off-site, you need to pre-identify the different staging areas that have been previously discussed by Madeline. Considerations for selecting an off-site relocation center include things such as how far away is it from the school? Is it far enough to avoid first responder traffic, if that's involved? Is it close enough for parent familiarity? They know where this center is located. Is it large enough for students and staff? How about the traffic and parking? Do you have uh, room for lines of parents? You need to provide for separation of staging areas. Does it have enough restrooms? And can it be secured? Another question for an off-site uh, center is, can you bring in food and water? Is Wi-Fi available, which you'll need? And can you pre-stage supplies, which can be important? You know, there are advantages of district site, off-site relocation centers, and non-district sites. Advantages for district sites include the availability of more staff, access to all rooms with keys, supplies stored on site, familiar with facility. You already know that, that uh, facility that you probably already have that wireless access. It is easier for distribution of food, snacks, and water. And then the advantages of non-district off-site relocation centers might include possibly larger assembly areas, uh, better ingress, egress to that site, potential for more parking, and that uh, really important that it would not interfere with another school's uh, day. Thanks, Jim. And uh, Gina, what are you looking for at this site which would help with physical and emotional care of students and families? Thanks, Paul. I think um, what Jim just spoke about really sets the stage for those aspects of support that really do then speak to the, um, to the emotional safety of our students. So if, as you can see, the first few bullets that are on the current slide really do speak to those elements. Um, but, but going forward, um, we, if we pay close attention to this, then we really are well on our way to making sure that we have the capacity to meet student and families' emotional needs in what's likely to be a highly stressful situation. So we want spaces that can accommodate any special needs that students may have, including those that may need some basic medical attention. We also think about site considerations that allow us to keep students calm and engaged during what would be potentially an extended period of time. So planning ahead for some of those very physical, like water snacks kind of needs that we just heard about, as well as how we might keep them quietly engaged, not with local TV where news coverage might add to the anxiety. This is another place where pre-planning is really important um, to know students with special physical, medical, or behavioral health needs because those should be emphasized, and making sure that we have trained and allocated sufficient staff to address those. In terms of parents, we want to make sure that the physical space conveys, to the extent possible, that sense of calm and order. And again, many of those, of those aspects that we've just heard about are going to be contributing to that. So the one that I would emphasize is making sure that we have um, particular attention to designated spaces where special concerns can be addressed, separate spaces for those without identification, and those who are going to need additional support from trained um, practitioners, for example, and I think Madeline addressed this, those with training in traumatic incidents or, um, or psychological first aid response in the event that a student has not yet been located or has been injured. Great. Great. Thanks, Gina. And uh, Stephen, what are some of the security and safety aspects to consider at a reunification site? And uh, what, are the differences, what are the differences between off-site versus on-site? Well, uh, first, don't be too quick to dismiss 
structures or field space that you you have on your campus because you're going to be familiar with uh, the uh, security aspects and of your own campus. Uh, so a primary reunification site may very well be your own school, uh, but you may need, may not be able to utilize your normal dismissal route. So kind of think out, outside the box there. Weather, power, water, sewer outages, gas leaks, chemical spills, fires, these kind of hazards are more likely to occur than on-site school violence. But safety teams need to go through kind of what we're doing, is that what-if scenario, the tabletop exercises. Consider more than one secondary location. Your emergency responders may um, have concerns with the site that you've chosen. Uh, at one of our schools, the district evacuated to a park, and at the park, they performed the reunification process. It was a challenge, but it can be done. So once a site is established as an option, then review the, the impact of the resources uh, within the proximity of that um, location. Consider transportation availability, school bus, city bus, charter bus, or even walking routes. And access to all anticipated vehicle traffic and parking. Uh, locally, we had a school select a nearby church for reunification, and the parking lot filled quickly so much so that the school bus couldn't even get the children in to drop off and start that reunification process. The location of the church was only a few hundred yards from the school, and parent vehicles clogged up the church um, for emergency vehicles. So once you're at the location, consider physical or even just perceived barriers. Everything from fencing to strategically placed vehicles to caution tape may be used to establish perimeters to allow for that ingress and egress of pedestrian traffic as well as vehicle traffic. Uh, use these type of barriers to appropriately separate the recommended areas of a unification, reunification site. Um, coordinate with your local first responders and uh, site or district security. I have found each district varies in their available resources. In law enforcement, we have uh, what's referred to as mutual aid agreements in place to assist each other in critical incidents. Uh, in this case, reach out to neighboring schools or districts to, and explore opportunities to assist each other in emergency situations. Because what we're uh, speaking directly to today is if one school is evacuating. And so there may be other available resources uh, with a neighbor, neighboring district. Great. Thanks, Stephen. So we're now going to start discussing how to facilitate a smooth family reunification. So uh, I'll ask Jim the question first. So Jim, what pre-event planning activities can help the response team with family reunification? Well, it, when I take a look at family reunification, I see uh, four main components that are important, important to include. Um, people, places, supplies, and process. You know, when you think about people, you're going to ask yourself, as part of your plan in the planning process, who is involved at the school, and I'm going to add, who is involved at the district level with reunification. Um, that uh, I realize that some districts are larger than others, and they have district personnel to help with that process. Uh, others uh, may not be, but that's part of that planning process. Once you identify the people, you're going to ask you know, you know, yourself and include in your plan what specific roles do they serve during reunification because there are a number of roles that need to be uh, completed. As far as people, uh, or excuse me, as far as places that, you know, is it going to be on-site or off-site reunification? And then with that, have you identified, have you pre-identified the staging areas for both? And again, I mentioned earlier that uh, so many uh, people make the mistake thinking that a school reunification is going to take place on-site when so often it happens off-site. So you have to determine staging areas for both. If when determining staging areas for off-site relocation centers, you're going to have to go visit that site, you're going to have to walk that site with your team and pre-identify those locations. Supplies. Supplies are so very important for reunification. You need to determine in advance what supplies are necessary to support a successful reunification for the largest school in your district. And I say that because typically school districts will have 
maybe one, two, three uh, groups of supplies available that they can distribute to a school, it's important that they take into consideration will that supply been, uh, be a, uh, adequate for the largest enrolled school in your district, specifically reunification forms. Uh, and then the process itself. You know, you need to develop and practice uh, your reunification annex for both on and off-site locations. It's important to include local law enforcement and fire in the, in the planning and the exercising there. And then, of course, you need to train your staff, your students, and parents on the reunification process prior to an event. Thanks, Jim. So, uh, Gina, what activities can support families and students in the reunification process? Thanks, Paul. So I think, again, Jim has given us the key systems components of this. And I think another thing that Madeline had said early on in the webinar um, is important to remember, which is that there are a wide range of precipitating situations. And how, we, how and what we activate or mobilize will be based on what those precipitating circumstances are. But there are some basic things that we can do that help us be more prepared especially as a new school year begins, but along the uh, course of the year, making sure that all information is up to date, especially in terms of, if, and we've already heard this, but it's important to emphasize who is authorized to pick up a student in an emergency, and of equal importance, who is not authorized if there are any legal restrictions pertaining to a specific student release. Details such as gaining immediate access to up-to-date bus assignments, daily attendance records, and other such things should be developed in advance, as well as thinking about what we might do if our electronic student information systems would not be accessible. And these matters can be addressed in those pre-planning tabletop exercises. Training and crisis and trauma response should be included in our annual professional development plans. And if at all possible, we should collaborate with cross-training with community mental health partners. That will increase our capacity and it also recognizes that the impacts of a large-scale event may go far beyond the existing resources that we might have on the spot, requiring us to reach out to community partners, and then also requiring a longer-term recovery plan. Thanks, Gina. Stephen, what security and safety activities can help the reunification process go more smoothly? One strategy to minimize stress for students would be to include familiarization activities with local responders. It could be emergency medical personnel, firefighters, police officers, deputies, troopers, and so forth. Um, having individuals who are in uniform interacting with the youth on that campus makes a tremendous impact when a critical incident occurs. And when it, when it does, when the event happens, those kids are familiar with that uniform. Um, and so I've seen success in this process to make it a little bit smoother when, when uh, emergency procedures are happening. Uh, for example, in the city of Chandler, we have a program where patrol officers actually go and visit schools uh, during lunchtime and such. And then uh, metaphorically speaking, if somebody yells, help, there's a fire, don't rush into that building because there might not be anybody in the building that needs rescue. Uh, the reunification is not a timed event. Staff should not rush uh, as they escort parents or students in critical incidents, uh, members of the public. Uh, when I say members of the public, I mean parents and staff. Uh, they will experience uh, a response or a survival urgency without putting everyone through critical incident stress management training, a, a simple emphasis of slowing things down and making it a deliberate process will help establish a smooth reunification process. And then during critical incidents, the presence of the media may contribute to unnecessary anxiety. If police or fire are responding to your emergency, an incident command system is going to be established, and their personnel will have a designated area for the media. If the district is managing the media, provide specific directions as to where the media needs to go and gather, uh, take control of that uh, added stress or anxiety. Thanks, Stephen. Our third topic will address how schools can communicate with families, which is a topic we've, we've touched on briefly before. So I'll start with Jim. Jim, how can schools communicate with families before an incident? 
Well, thanks, Paul. That's always a good question, and I think it, it's pretty simple and to the point in that parents need to know what their roles and responsibilities are during a crisis or emergency at the school. So it's certainly good to provide information to parents regarding readiness and that the school, in fact, does have an emergency operations plan, that it is a good idea to provide parents with training. Uh, you can do that by uh, providing an online training module for parents in which you're identifying what their roles and responsibilities are during an emergency. For example, please don't call the school, please don't come to the school until directed to do so. Uh, you can find information regarding the emergency on the district website or we'll be using social media to convey that information. Let parents know that ahead of time. And then you can also highlight uh, in informational for parents uh, and in the training modules, basically, what protocols you do have in place in your plan. Of course, you're not going to give them the specificity of everything in your plan. Uh, a lot of that information needs to stay confidential. But you can talk to parents about you do have a plan for a lockdown. You do have a plan for off-site relocation. You do have a plan for reunification. And that will provide them with great comfort knowing that those things are in place. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so, Gina, Jim talked about communication before an emergency or before that re family reunification process is needed. Um, how can schools communicate with families during an incident? It's so critically important because our families are accustomed to relying upon us to communicate information. And, and again, what, what Jim said about being able to be as specific as possible applies during the event every bit as much as, as before. So the planning team needs an up-to-date community profile in order to know which channels are most effective for reaching our families. And if there are any technological or language barriers that need to be anticipated, and what our contingency plans are for those. Many schools rely on an automated alert system that allows messages to be delivered by voice, text, and email simultaneously. But we need to think about how we will communicate if this system was for some reason unavailable, or if we knew that it was not going to hit all of the families that we needed to communicate with. So integrating this with our EOP communications annex, um, the spokespersons from our school district should be identified in advance, as well as how we might use local media to assist us with broader communications, and sometimes other important community partners, such as our local clergy or municipal agencies will have mechanisms that can be integrated into our own plan. Thanks, Gina. So, uh, Stephen, what communication can help with security? Uh, I think uh, Jim's uh, mentioned a little bit of uh, what I was covering. You know, a normal reaction uh, during an incident, we all turn on the media to see what is happening. So uh, you might want to utilize the media, utilize the, your public information officer to get that word out. On site, provide a school communication radio to emergency responders to monitor and coordinate your efforts. Uh, it'd be valuable to provide a sufficient number of radios to each area of the reunification process and consider having them com communicate on separate channels. Uh, emphasize the importance of voice inflection, tone, professionalism, being conveyed over the airways, and always be aware that students, parents, or the media may be hearing what is being said. Uh, if there are areas of concern or potential conflict that start to develop during an incident, communicate to law enforcement and ask them to place a police officer or uh, even an empty patrol car in the area to promote a sense of calm and control. Um, and that could uh, assist in uh, utilizing what we, we refer to as strategic visibility. Um, and that communicates to individuals that are arriving on scene or um, on scene that they, there is control, there is calm. Uh, it's like the, uh, the classic speeding cars in the school zone. When uh, my crossing guards asked me to go uh, catch speeders who are speeding through the crosswalk, every time I go out there, everybody behaves just perfectly. And uh, it's just a matter of uh, that command presence. So communicate to law enforcement if you see a need during the incident. Thanks, Stephen. 
Now we're going to address some of the biggest challenges to family reunification and how schools can resolve them. So I'll start with Jim again. So Jim, what about uh, challenges and opportunities when it comes to planning? Yeah, you know, Paul, let's talk about planning in, in two different areas. One, planning in the development of your emergency operations plan, and then planning to complete exercises te to test your plan. You know, hopefully district and school personnel as well as community partners uh, to include law enforcement, fire, public health, possibly emergency management, are involved in the development in, uh, or the review of the school's emergency operations plan. You know, that in itself is always a challenge with coordinating calendars for planned development meetings between the different agencies in the school. Um, getting into the exercise phase, finding available time for planning and conducting exercises is also a challenge. Completing a really good exercise takes time and takes pre-planning. And so again, you're going to get into that challenge of, uh, let's say we're talking about a comprehensive off-site relocation family reunification exercise. You know, it might in itself require two or three planning meetings uh, with the school, the school district, and uh, law enforcement and fire. And then also it's important to incorporate you know, in the exercise process to, and the plan to incorporate the needs of students with disabilities and limited English speaking students, that it's also equally important to include this population in your off-site relocation, family reunification exercise. That in itself will tell you a lot about the quality of your plan and your ability to carry it out without difficulty. Thanks, Jim. Gina, what about challenges and opportunities in caring for families and students? The biggest challenge, I think, and we've, I think we've all said it in one way or another, is to maintain that sense of calm, confidence, <coughs> excuse me, and safety. <coughs> and could you go to the next slide, please? Sure. So uh, we'll move on to. Stephen, so Stephen, what are some of the challenges and opportunities in security and safety? Well, um, the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing and the Commission of Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies recognizes the importance of building relationships outside of critical incidents uh, and official enforcement. Every interaction, whether good or bad, uh, that an organization faces together has the potential to increase interagency cooperation and confidence uh, when done correctly. Specific to the reunification process, I have witnessed through my training and experience challenges related to court-appointed custody and guardianship. Uh, staff need to follow the check-in and verification process to avoid these potential abductions or possible child trafficking emergencies. If a parent or guardian cannot be contacted or pick up a child, follow the listed emergency contacts. If someone is making claims as to custody or guardianship and provides documents on that day of the emergency, contact law enforcement and verify it through the appropriate court system. In law enforcement, we train by examining case studies, best practices, and role play. It'd be important to tabletop what uh, exercises and actual uh, tabletop these events and then um, have actual site visits by your administrator or district, district personnel. And that will provide an increased level of confidence for those who will be training prior to or directing during a reunification process. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, Gina, uh, challenges for challenges and opportunities in caring for families and students. Thank you. So again, maintaining that sense of calm and confidence and safety are the are the vital goals. And so for our students, we need to be able to help them build skills, and we do this through drills and practices and ongoing discussion. For our families, we want to build their confidence that we have the plan. And of course, we talked about how frequent communication is going to help us with that. And then for all, making sure that um, for our staff, building capacity through regular training and making sure that all stakeholders have input and are represented. 
One challenge that I think um, is hard for schools to address is to plan those meaningful large-scale opportunities for practice. And so we try to encourage, in our own district, finding ways to do this in embedded opportunities, such as routine dismissal, where we ask for a particular day that people will show ID, or following a field trip, or an event like a school dance, where we would actually recreate the family reunification scenario in a modest way so that we have an opportunity to understand what the needs are, what our response roles and responsibilities might be, and where some of our obstacles might occur. Thanks, Gina. So uh, we're going to move on to uh, what a successful family reunification should look like. So again, I'll start with, uh, with, uh, with Jim. So Jim, what does a successful, uh, successful family reunification look like to you? Uh, you know, for me, four points for a successful reunification. Uh, number one, reunification needs to be orderly and it needs to be focused on the safety of students and staff at all times. Two, you need to ensure the accountability of students and staff, again, at all times. Uh, three, it's important to provide for students and staff members who have access and functional needs. And then four, it needs to allow for an orderly and managed return of students to their parents and guardians. Great. Thanks, Jim. And uh, Gina, to you, what would successful family reunification look like with regard to support for families and students? I think we need to bear in mind that while we've been talking about this, and it certainly is responding to an emergency situation, it actually can be thought of as an emergency situation in and of itself and require the same dynamics of planning that we would implement on any other aspect of our protocol. So the ideal would be that we have a physical space that is adequate to meet the needs of students and the number of family members that would be arriving and the staff and teachers who will be supporting them, um, that we have the resources available, that all areas are clearly marked, that students can remain calm and well supervised by familiar and caring adults, that family members are reassured that the process will move as efficiently as possible, and that provisions for any child or family with special concerns are appropriately sensitive to the emotional needs of those involved. And very important, a plan is in place for any long-term recovery needs that may impact students, families, staff, and our first responders. Thanks, Gina. And Stephen, so uh, successful family reunification for you with regards safety and security? But it's pretty simple. Um, uh, ultimately, this is a, a debrief, and to recognize um, during a debrief that uh, whether it's a good or a bad experience, that we've increased our interagency cooperation, that we're confident in the stakeholders in our community. Uh, and bottom line is, from a safety and security perspective, a successful reunification results in the safe return of all students, staff, and emergency responders to their homes and families, safe and sound. Thank you. So thank you to all of our panel members. And uh, we're now going to move into the final section of our webinar, where you have the opportunity to pose questions to today's panel members. As a reminder, to ask a question, you can use the Q&A box visible on your screen. The questions will be sent to the moderator only. You can also email us at info at remstacenter.org. So we'll start looking at the questions now. Um, we've received one via the Q&A box. Um, and I'm going to direct this to Gina. So Gina, uh, what is the emergency contact cards or other lists as to which parents and guardians can take custody of the child is not available? Uh, what if the emergency contact cards are unavailable, uh, possibly because of an incident such as hazmat? Um, how do you prepare or respond to a situation like that? Thanks, Paul. So I think, and we did touch about this just a little bit, but there may be um, situations where, because of the circumstances, 
um, could be a utility failure. The, the normal course in which we access student information may not be accessible. It's really important to think those things through in advance. Um, a lot of our, our, our administrators have ways to access that information remotely. Um, there, there may be ways within our, our towns and, and municipal structures to be able to um, access our systems remotely as well. Um, in, I know of some um, schools where they really do rely on uh, like hard copy, um, tangible. The, the um, nurse's office, for example, will have binders where this information is actually printed and that they will have that in their go kit as they are, as they are leaving. I think the, the key thing here isn't so much what specific thing works, but to recognize that there may be circumstances where we won't have access to that information. And if we incorporate that into our tabletop or into our drill and practice, we will force ourselves to recognize what resources we do have to access the information through those varieties of circumstances that we might find. Great, thanks, Gina. Um, we've also got another question. Um, can I get a copy of this presentation? Um, so absolutely. So uh, if you go to the handout uh, pod on your screen or box on your screen, uh, there's, a, there's a resource there, webinar slides. So you can actually download the slides today. Also, you can have access to an archived version of this event, which has been recorded, uh, along with the resource guide. Um, that's going to be on our webinars page uh, within 10 business days. Uh, if you look at the, the web links box on your screen, uh, you'll see there's a, a link to REMS webinars. Uh, that will take you directly to our webinars page, and uh, it'll be archived within uh, 10 business days. Uh, another question that, we, that has come in, I'm going to pose this one to Stephen. Um, I work in a K through 8 school that has a pretty solid family reunification plan in place. Uh, should we have to activate our family reunification annex? How do we handle the general public who will want to use our school for shelter, supplies, communications, and medical care? We only have enough supplies for students and staff, uh, so security could be an issue. Any advice you could provide would be great. So um, Stephen, can you help answer that? You know, that's a, that's a bigger global question that uh, certainly would include more stakeholders that could provide further information on that. From a law enforcement standpoint, we train on these more larger incidents. And so I would really reach out to your local municipalities to assist with that. Um, we've got mutual aid. We've got cooperative agreements in place. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's what I would suggest doing. Um, take this exact scenario to those stakeholders and, and say, what what should I do? What resources are available? And then I, I wouldn't rule out any resources, including nonprofit organizations uh, that would be uh, coming to the aid of your community during those incidents. Network with them so you know exactly uh, how to get a hold of them uh, in the most immediate fashion. And oh, I thank you. Add, oh, sorry. Oh, you go ahead. Um, if I could just add, too, that in selection of sites, it's important to know if that um, site is designated as a, as a community emergency shelter, there may be mm -hmm. very specific circumstances where it would not make a good family reunification location. And so, mm -hmm. again, the, the emphasis on the, the planning and the pre-assessment comes into play here. And this is Madeline. Um, that question, <laughs> that question, um, in you know, in theory, if we are planning um, with the school system, uh, if there's planning going on in collaboration between the school system and that local um, municipality, and uh, um, then it's integrated. And so those are the kinds of questions you'd want to work out in advance. And, um, and those are the different kinds of considerations, so going back to that all settings and all times. And then also, if the community is relying on the school to serve as an asset, um, that's a further prompt for you to be sitting down together. So to all um, school officials, I encourage you, if you're not um, leadership at your school system, 
than to go to your lead leadership in a polite and respectful manner. Um, and um, it's important that you sit down together. Oftentimes this is not happening. This is one of those assumptions that causes problems. And so uh, we always say that the table needs to be set so schools and the local communities can get together. If the schools aren't being invited, I encourage you, school leadership, to invite that community leadership to your table. And um, that can be the beginning of a very, very powerful relationship. And if through that integration and collaboration, it'll help. Uh, um, like Gina was saying, it's, there's times when it's not the most fitting um, selection and such. It's just going to increase everyone's capacity before, during, and after. Thanks, Madeline. And uh, we have received quite a few questions uh, that we're not going to have time to answer during the webinar, but uh, we will be continuing the conversation in our community of practice uh, immediately following this webinar. And uh, uh, that's, uh, the, uh, the URL, the web page for that will be opened up immediately after this event. So uh, we'll try to uh, answer the remaining questions in that community of practice. But, um, I just want to thank everyone who has posed the question, and a special thank goes to our presenters, Jim Lee from the Arizona Department of Education, Dr. Gina Khan from the Hamden Wilbraham Regional School District, and Stephen Joe from the Chandler Police Department. If you have any questions for any of the presenters, again, you can post them in the community of practice, or you can email the WEMS TA Center, and we will forward your request to the appropriate person. Thank you also for participating in this webinar. An archive is going to be available, as I mentioned, on the REMS TA Center's webinars page within about 10, 10 business days. And you can continue to connect and collaborate with us in a variety of ways, including through our toll-free telephone line and, of course, the email address, info at remstacenter.org. And be sure to find us on Twitter for daily updates on TA Center activities and important information and services from our collaborative partners. Finally, as I mentioned, uh, we've started a new forum on our community of practice to discuss today's topics in more detail. We are encouraging to pose questions to presenters, the OSHS and REMS TA Center team, and your colleagues, or to share resources. Uh, you should be automatically forwarded to the COP when this webinar ends. If not, first log into the community of practice. The login button is available at the top of our website and the web links box on your screen. Once you've logged in, click, click K2 Tile Public Forum, then the Reunification Forum, and finally the Family Reunification Web Chat Post. If you have any issues accessing the forum, again, feel free to email us at info at remcacenter.org. We'll be live on the Community of Practice, or COP, for about 30 minutes, answer any additional questions and the ones that were posed during the event, and uh, also to hear about any additional insights you have to share about emergency preparedness and reunification um, after a school-wide emergency. Thank you for your time today, and this concludes the webinar.